staat een koffie en thee voor u klaar. Dank u wel. Goedenavond. Oh, ik vind het altijd zo spannend dit allemaal. Of jullie er allemaal wel in passen, maar jullie passen er allemaal in. 750 ouders en studenten, van harte welkom. Fijn dat u er bent. En ook een warm welkom voor alle ouders die vanavond, die vanuit het buitenland vanavond met ons meekijken. En voor hen loopt achter mij de ondertiteling mee. Ik heb het gezien. U heeft kinderen. Ik heb ook kinderen. En wat wij allemaal willen, is dat onze zonen en dochters een goede toekomst tegemoet gaan. Dat ze gewoon goed terechtkomen. En daar zijn we mee bezig als ouder vanaf het moment dat ze naar de basisschool en vervolgens naar de middelbare school gaan. En u werd door die scholen bij hun ontwikkeling en hun keuzes zeer betrokken. Ja en dan, ik weet het zelf nog heel goed. Toen mijn oudste dochter alweer meer dan tien jaar geleden naar het hbo ging. En de boodschap was eigenlijk laat los. Ze staat nu op eigen benen en je hebt als ouder geen bemoeienis meer met haar studie. Ik vond die abrupte overgang toen echt niet fijn. Want je wilt toch betrokken zijn bij het nieuwe leven van je kind. En sterker nog, wij van de Hanse Hogeschool vinden dat dat moet. En dat uw betrokkenheid een van de belangrijke factoren is voor studiesucces van uw kind. En daarom organiseert de Hanse Hogeschool in oktober voor alle ouders van alle eerstejaarsstudenten deze avond. Met als doel dat wij u vanavond meenemen in de nieuwe wereld van uw zoon of dochter. Studeren aan het hbo. Ik begin met u een vraag te stellen. Wie van u weet welke tentamens uw zoon of dochter de komende periode heeft... en welke opdrachten af moeten en wanneer? Niemand? Kom op, steek die vinger eens op. U weet het niet? <lacht> weet u of er überhaupt gestudeerd wordt? Voor een zesje... Of voor een acht? Ik krijg geen antwoord. Voor ons is die eerste tentamenperiode een eerste belangrijke meting. En dat kan twee kanten op gaan. Allereerst studenten die een acht of een hoger halen. Deze studenten vallen ons op. Dat zijn talenten, studenten die boven het maaiveld willen uitsteken. Misschien wel onze toekomstige onderstudenten. Maar ook de andere kant op. Studenten die een onvoldoende hebben behaald. Komt dat omdat ze niet hard genoeg gewerkt hebben? Of dat ze misschien erg moeten wennen aan het andere systeem van leren? Gelukkig is er voor hen nog geen man overboord. Er is gelegenheid om het vak nog één keer te herkansen. Kern van mijn verhaal is vanavond. Hoe kunnen uw zoon en dochter... En wij en u als ouder er in gezamenlijkheid voor zorgen dat we elkaar in 2021 weer zien bij de diploma-uitreiking. Allereerst moet u weten dat het studeren aan de hogeschool heel anders is dan het leren op de middelbare school of het mbo. In principe is de student zelf verantwoordelijk voor zijn studiesucces. En dat betekent dat de student zelf zijn studie plant en organiseert. En dat is wennen. Sommigen pakken dat zo op en anderen hebben wat langer tijd nodig. En daarom is er vanuit de opleiding met name veel begeleiding en sturing, ook sturing in het eerste jaar. Iedere klas heeft een studieloopbaanbegeleider of een mentor waar uw zoon of dochter steeds terecht kan 
met allerlei vragen. En de studieloopbaan begeleiden praat ook regelmatig met uw zoon of dochter over de studievoortgang. Zeker als straks na het eerste blok echt niet goed is gescoord. Een ander verschil met de middelbare school of het mbo is, is dat de hoeveelheid lesstof die er voor een tentamen moet worden geleerd echt veel groter is. En de praktijk leert dan ook dat als een student niet direct begint met het studeren aan het begin van een blok, en we hebben vier blokken in een jaar, de kans groot is, ja, dat je tentamen of de opdracht niet haalt. En wij doen er alles aan om de studenten dat besef bij te brengen. Nog een verschil met een middelbare school is, is dat uw kind hier wordt opgeleid voor een beroep. En daar hoort professioneel gedrag bij. En wij spreken hen daar ook op aan. Op tijd komen moet je later ook op je werk. Ook samenwerken en plannen, feedback kunnen geven en ontvangen. En professioneel met elkaar en de faciliteiten omgaan. Wat u ook moet weten is dat een student hier gedurende zijn studie, nou u weet het, studie duurt vier jaar, heel veel keuzes moet maken. En dat begint zeker ook al in dit eerste jaar. Ik hoop het niet, maar misschien heeft u er nu al mee te maken dat uw zoon of dochter hardop heeft durven, al durven te zeggen, pap en mam, ik ben er eigenlijk niet meer zo heel zeker van of de opleiding zo wel bij mij past. Stoppen? Iets anders gaan doen? Of dat uw kind rond de kerst van zijn SLB'er het advies krijgt om te stoppen met de studie, omdat wij er dan al niet meer in geloven dat hij voldoende studiepunten haalt in het eerste jaar, of dat de inzetmotivatie echt veel te laag is. En deze dingen gebeuren en horen bij 17, 18-jarigen die nog volop aan het zoeken zijn en midden in hun ontwikkeling staan of gewoon het nieuwe studentenleven in de stad Groningen veel en veel te leuk vinden. En daarom stopt ook ieder jaar ongeveer 25% van de studenten in het eerste jaar. En dat geldt voor alle opleidingen van de Haanse Hogeschool en landelijk ligt dat percentage nog hoger. En wij zeggen dan, ga thuis, serieus aan de praat, ga het gesprek aan en als het echt niet gaat, laat je dan uitschrijven van de opleiding. Maar het kan ook zijn, en dat gebeurt gelukkig in de meeste gevallen, dat uw kind zegt, ik vind het hartstikke leuk op mijn opleiding. Ik vind het een mooi beroep en sterker nog, de behoefte er heeft om in de vier jaar niet alleen te studeren, maar ook andere belangrijke ervaringen op te doen. En voor die studenten zijn er heel veel kansen om het allerbeste uit zichzelf te halen. Zijn talenten optimaal te ontplooien en zelfs uit te willen blinken. En wij zouden graag zien dat u dat stimuleert. Zo kan uw zoon of dochter geselecteerd worden voor het Hanse Honders College. Of studentassistent worden. Of in het bestuur gaan zitten van een van onze studieverenigingen. Of deel gaan uitmaken van de medezeggenschap. Of een periode in het derde of in het vierde jaar gaat studeren. Of stage gaat lopen in het buitenland. En bij het maken van al die keuzes spelen wij natuurlijk een belangrijke rol. Maar ook uw rol is belangrijk. Betrokkenheid, klankbord, gesprekspartner zijn van uw zoon of dochter is heel belangrijk. Tot slot. Wij nemen u mee vanavond in de nieuwe wereld van uw kind. Een wereld die opleidt voor een beroep in de communicatie, in de ICT, in de mediasector of de creatieve industrie. Waarbij uw zoon of dochter begeleid wordt door docenten, vakmensen die heel vaak zelf het beroep nog in de praktijk uitoefenen. Ik wens u allen een leuke, leerzame avond toe onder begeleiding van de studenten. Waar sta je? Daar staan ze. En daar staan ze. Geweldige studenten uit ons PR-voorlichtingsteam. En uh, geef ze een warm applaus. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this presentation of uh, international communication, which is, of course, in English. For a number of reasons, we are an international program, so we speak English all day. 
but you might say, oh, you probably suspect there's a lot of Dutch people here, and I do think there are a lot of Dutch people here, probably. But at the same time, you see this guy with a camera behind you. Um, he is going to videotape this uh, meeting so that later on, parents who are abroad can also follow what we have been doing. And we're not going to use the subtitling part because we can speak English. And I hope, hope that you can follow everything that we uh, talk about. Uh, if you would like to ask questions or would like to respond to what the teachers are asking you, then if you would like to do it in Dutch, that's not a problem. We can understand Dutch. There's no, uh, that's not a problem. All right. So we're going to talk about chances and opportunities. My name is Rose Kempen. I am the program manager of this uh, uh, a program, this bachelor program, and also with us is Tom Wilcox, who is going to deliver a lecture to you on intercultural communication later on tonight. And then also we have Rixt Feldhuis and uh, Sarah de Leeuw, two students. Don't you want to sit down, by the way? Um, uh, two students who are going to tell you something about their experience. Rixt is a second year student. She has just passed her propedeutic phase. And come on in. Come on in. And Sarah is a fourth year student who has already finished her third year, which is an important part of our bachelor program. And why am I using this microphone? That is because if I don't use a microphone and I will hand it on to the rest, then the video will be bad uh, for audio quality. So it's not to help me speak in public. All right. Um, First, I'm going to show you a short video. This was a short video that we made last year. Uh, a few of our teachers made it, actually, um, to help us come through accreditation. I'll talk about that later on, too. Um, these are the academic counselors of the first year. Uh, your son or daughter will be in one of the groups. Uh, we have Matt Wegman, Tom Wilcox, Joyce Kremers, who is ill today, uh, Giuseppe Rosdino, who is also with us, uh, Fiona, happy birthday, Fiona, and Bob's. She's also here somewhere. Probably she'll be downstairs later on to talk to you. Um, academic counselling, as our dean already told you, is, uh, was installed to help your students, your sons and daughters, uh, through their um, bachelor programme. And they counsel their students on loads of things. Some people need a lot of counselling, some people can find their own way, but if necessary, this academic counsellor is always there for them throughout the bachelor programme. Um, and it is about orientation to the program, it is about which choices shall I make, and as you will see later on, there are a number of choices to be made. Um, personal development is, is very important because uh, in communication a lot of skills are involved. You need to be able to uh, foresee a crisis and preferably help, it, help prevent uh, happening. Uh, and that's the block they're working on at the moment. Uh, but you could be a spokesman. You could uh, take care of online communication. You could be a copywriter or take care of brand management. There's a lot of stuff that you can do as a communication professional. Things we haven't even heard of now because the, the uh, profession is changing a lot. A typical week at IC is that you have project classes, you have theory classes, Three theory classes consist of general lectures, which are done in a big hall. Uh, something like 160 or 170 students will follow the, uh, that lecture. And then 
The theory is discussed and practiced again in the seminar with a teacher in a usual classroom of 25 to 28. And then we have skills classes, and the skills classes are advisory skills and tool skills, so be, because they need to be able to make videos, for instance, or to make an infographic, or to use pictures uh, to explain something. And in all, there will be something between 18 and 20 hours of contact time every week for seven weeks on end. So if your son is, or daughter is not there, then, uh, or is home all the time, then maybe he's skipping. Um, the structure of a block is also, uh, with the credits, on project, theory, and skills. And for each of these components, there are five credits. So 15 credits to a block, four blocks to a year. So in all, you get 60 credits at the end of the year. And if you have all your 60 credits, you will have passed the first year. And they are equally, equally divided. Um, here they deliver a professional product. Um, for theory, they get a written exam. And we are going to make most of the, the exams digital. So the writing will be in the computer. And uh, usually they um, design a portfolio to come up with uh, products that they learn in skills. Now, this is the first year. I'm not going to talk about the first year very much because Rixt is going to tell you about the first year. Uh, but we have four blocks, crisis and reputation, online branding, media and entrepreneurship, and the event. Rixt will tell you all about it. Um, and then in the main phase, so once they've passed the first year, they enter into the main phase, we have semester blocks. The first semester block is um, devoted to making a campaign, designing a campaign. Um, they do some research first on what target, target group they should target, and then they design a campaign in the second block. And then the second block is on internationalization and transition. Uh, there they um, work for a client. In both cases, by the way, they work for a real client. Uh, and they... Um, uh, th this client has an internationalization wish. They want to go abroad with their products or they, th they want to do something abroad. And the student tries to find out what their context is, what their communication is, their internal communication, gives an advice and helps them to, through a transition to become more international. Um, and then in the third year, we call the third year the life changer. The third year they go abroad. The general rule for students at IC is to spend at least one year working and studying abroad. So a semester study and a semester of working abroad. Um, and of course the foreign students can do that. Uh, they are already studying abroad because they're with us, but they have to do an internship semester abroad and the Dutch students have to go abroad for both a study and an internship semester. So the elective semester for foreign students can be a study abroad or a minor at Hansa, but for Dutch students it has to be a study abroad. And then the internship semester is also usually spent abroad. And why especially the internship semester and not the graduation assignment semester, because you can also do that in a company abroad, that is because usually students uh, would like to spend their last um, work in a company where they might possibly expect to get a job. So they need to be, to be free to choose whatever country they want to work in when they do their graduation assignment. So we advise them to finish with the international requirements of being a year abroad in the third year, and then you're free to choose whatever you want in the fourth year. In the fourth year, they start off with a major specific minor, which is uh, a minor that is specific to our program and has to do with public affairs or with a business topic, international business communication. And then they go to uh, do their graduation assignment, which can be a regular one, which means that they do a graduation assignment with a company that they found themselves, or they do one in what we call an innovation lab. And an innovation lab is here in the in the area uh, where our professorship, Communication and the Sustainable Society, uh, and the uh, partners in uh, the professional field work together on innovation topics. Uh, so that's more of a research um, 
assignment, which will end with a product, by the way. Uh, if I'm forgetting something, please help me, colleagues. Another thing that students have to choose while they're here in the first year is, do I want to stand out from the rest? Do I want to um, get a good position in the labor market later on, and do I want to stand out? And one of the ways to stand out is to take part in the honors program, which is a 30 credits, ex a 30 credits extracurricular program, so they have to do 30 credits extra. They can do that. Or they can take part, as the dean said, for instance, in jobs, uh, the uh, marketing job that those two students have, or uh, take part in the participation council, work at KIC. Uh, a lot of things are possible. Now, the most uh, challenging thing is to get your P in one year, your proper duty diploma. And uh, as I said, there are 60 credits in year one. And... Um, you will be advised, you get a negative binding study advice, so advised to quit the program if you have 40, less than 48 credits at the end of the year. Um, but we always say, go for the 60. And why is that? That is because, especially because you're in an international program, uh, if you accumulate backlog, you will get a big delay in your studies. So it's best to get all your 60 credits in one year, both in year one, but also in year two. Because, uh, as you can see, in year two, most students are abroad, are abroad all, all year. So if they have backlog from year two, then they'll get problems because they have to do their assessments and their exams here, and it's impossible to do an exam abroad. So in all cases, get your 60 credits in one year is the advice we give our students. The progress re requirements in year three and four, the general progress requ requirements are 50 credits, then you can move on to the next year. So that is something like an 80% score of the, uh, the credits that you need to have. Um, so you can go on, uh, but it's best to have the, the 60 credits. And then of course you get your diploma, which is a fantastic occasion. Our diploma ceremonies are famous, and uh, I hope I will see you all on, I think, July 16, uh, 2021. Um, oh, oops. Oops, oops, oops. Thank you. Um, and last year, we um, were visited for accreditation. Every bachelor program in the Netherlands has to go through accreditation once every six years. And we did that last year. And actually, we were rewarded a certificate for internationalization. We aimed for that, and we got it as well. Uh, it is not, has not been confirmed uh, officially yet, but we know that we're going to get it before the end of the year. So that's really good. And uh, also, not too long ago, the Dutch Keuzegids was published. And... Um, over the years, our program has moved from the 14th place to the third place in the, the national ranking uh, of 19 programs in, uh, in the Netherlands. And actually, IC is first, but uh, that's easier because there are only three or four international programs in the Netherlands, so that's much easier. But being ranked third in uh, the complete set of com communication programs is already a, a good achievement. So what are your roles then in the end? You can become almost anything. <coughs> Event manager, is it there? Probably. Uh, social media specialist, content manager, you can do a lot of things. And in order to find out what our students do, I'm going to show you uh, a short video. Hey, I'm Niklas. My name is Melanie. Hi, my name is Ilana. Hi, I'm Dorit. And we studied international communication at the Hans University of Applied Sciences in Groningen. Hi guys, uh, welcome to Stockholm. Right after graduation, I started working for L'Oreal in Amsterdam as a brand manager. But after seven years abroad, it was time to go back home to Stockholm in Sweden. I work at Invice as an inbound strategy and marketing manager. Uh, I help clients with their digital challenges, turning them into successful marketing and sales campaigns. The thing I love with my job is that it's really diverse. Yesterday I was talking with a client about a marketing campaign in Sweden. 
Another day I'll be having a big presentation for a client that is live streamed throughout India, France and Germany. And then the third day I can be at a Google training, for example. Every day is different, uh, something I really love. As a communications advisor, I do a lot of different things. I write brochures, I monitor the media for clients, uh, I organize PR campaigns, and one of my last projects is Football for Friendship, which is a social initiative uh, for kids around the world about football. And the highlight of the project is attending the Champions League final. I sat on the sixth row and could almost touch uh, Ronaldo. Because I studied international communication, all the international projects are thrown at me. So basically I have the best of both worlds. I came here um, because the organisation that I did my internship with in my third year offered me a job right after graduation, so I was really lucky with that. And I worked for them uh, for a year on one specific project, but that finished. Um, but then um, I now work for Ethical Journalism Network. At Ethical Journalism Network I work mainly with um, newsletters, social media, I work on the website, um, I work on search engine optimization to make sure that the website is findable in Google. I feel like I contribute to something um, because it's obviously a non-profit organization, there's not a lot of people, we don't have an office, so we have very, very low cost, but we do get project money in. Um, and that means that we can actually do something meaningful with, with the money that we have and that we can um, yeah, support journalists all over the world. I can work from home, but also I like to go and explore London, so I go outside and sit in new coffee places that I'd like to discover. I work on projects in developing countries where we share our educational programs with other higher educational institutions. Just three weeks ago, I visited Tanzania, where I visited five universities. Uh, we're doing projects with them in the areas of energy and healthcare. During my study international communication, I worked together with people from a lot of different countries and that made the group work really interesting. And now I have a group of friends and professionals around the world. This uh, short video was also made for this accreditation uh, event last year. Um, but it's true that uh, many students um, get a job somewhere around the world. Some 30% 30 30 of the students continue studying afterwards, so they do a master somewhere, uh, and often abroad, because here in the Netherlands you have to um, do a, a, a gap year, no, not a gap year, uh, an extra year to, to be allowed to do a master, but they often go abroad. And 50% uh, finds, uh, so that's 70% uh, left, then 50% of those find a job within a year. So they are really good at finding a good place to work. And they can work anywhere in the world. Okay, now I'll stop. Uh, it's time for uh, Rixt, unless you have um, questions for me. It can also, the questions can also be asked later, but is there anybody who would like, who'd like to ask a question? Rix, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, hello guys, I'm Rix, um, second year IC student, and uh, I'm just going to talk shortly about my first year. Um, so, um, the first year, um, <laughs> some of you might know this, I guess the parents might not, so maybe some of them do. Um, the first exam, everyone's almost going to study for them right now, like in th two or three weeks we will have the first exam. Um, everyone's saying to you, like the, the professors, etc., will say, start studying, start studying now. But everyone, I know, all of you will study almost one week in advance and then think two days before the exam, oh shoot, there's a lot of work to do. And then um, in the end, you do make up to that because you, you spend those two days fully studying and uh, trying to make the best of it. Um, no worries, your exam will be different than what you um, are used to from high school or your uh, primary uh, previous education. Um, but it will not be a disaster. It will be fine. You will be fine. It is different, but it's okay. It's survivable. <laughs> Um, projects. Um, you all uh, are doing your first uh, blog project now. I will not talk about that because you all know what it is going, uh, what it is about. 
Um, so I will talk about my um, second block project. Um, we had to do a, uh, we had to create a campaign, an online marketing campaign for a company in Groningen van Hully, which is a, a company who um, creates um, um, underwear from old shirts from your parents or your boyfriend or whatever. You can send them in, and then. Um, women who do need that education or um, have struggles in their own life will um, uh, are provided with a workplace at Van Hully and they help them to educate them and um, uh, make sure that they get a stable place in, the so in society. And uh, what we did was um, we basically, um, with our campaign, we uh, made that the focus was more on them rather than the product and everything they would, uh, were, were standing for. So we tried to make sure that everyone knew about those women behind those, the, the product. And um, because everyone in Groningen kind of knows about Van Holly, but not what they're about. Um, so we tried to do that. And in the end, we ended up being the best presentation and campaign. And they actually um, implemented all of our uh, advice. Uh, which was really great, of course, and maybe some of you will have that as well in the second block. Um, we also had to do with that block, we also had to create, uh, with tools for example, we had to create uh, our own um, media. So for example, we had to create a social media profile for Van Halle. We had to make uh, give them advice on how to improve, what they could do better to uh, um, gain more, gain a better target audience or um, reach their target audience in a better way. And um, together with all of um, our project group members, we uh, try to figure out who could do what and then um, make sure that we could make something great and then give them the advice to do this. Um, the third block was about creating your own business. Um, I personally wasn't a fan of that. Um, I um, previously studied IBS, so I was all about business, etc. And I went to uh, IC to do the more creative stuff. I was like, well, do I like this? And uh, in the end, it was a hard, it was a struggle. But with the help of uh, the teachers and um, fellow students, we did manage to create some pretty cool businesses. Um, I um, came up with the idea to uh, have Foodbody, which was an application where you could um, um, basically say, um, hello, I'm having dinner at whatever like, whatever time, I'm having this and this, do you want to join? And then uh, students can um, sign up and pay online for the app application to join you. And then uh, you can have dinner basically with a stranger. Well, you, it is a student because that would be like some sort of security system that it would be only for students. But you could just meet up with students and get to know other people. Um, and ex especially for internationals, this would be a really cool way to uh, also meet international, uh, other internationals or locals. Um, with that uh, project, we had to create, for example, like personas. We had to um, uh, conduct research whether and whom would be our best target group. We have to uh, look at what they would be attracted to and how we would be able to approach them. Um, so for tools, we had to do this with InDesign. We had to create this whole profile and we would get graded for that. Um, my last block, the event, uh, which pretty, was again pretty cool, uh, with four other students, with three other students, I'm sorry, um, we um, researched um, the comparison between a music and art event manager. Um, we all were qu quite interested in event management, so we wanted to look at that. And um, um, we all knew a bit about festivals, etc. But we wanted to have a look at what the differences were between. Um, we focused on Into the Great Wide Open, which is a festival on Vlieland, and um, the Groninger Museum. And we focused on the differences between the tasks that they would do, but also the differences between the events. So um, we looked at, for example, the logistics, the um, media, how do you approach your target audience, what is your target audience? And um, basically the conclusion was that the um, daily tasks weren't too uh, different from each other. 
However, for the festival, um, there are loads of loads of event managers for one event. And for the Groningen Museum, you only have two event managers who have their own events within Groningen Museum. So they organize 200 events per year, whereas uh, the event manager for the festival will organize one event and then do that with 30 other event managers. So that's quite a big di difference. And um, here you see a picture of us visiting the Groningen Museum because we had to do that as well. We had to visit and interview uh, the companies that we were researching, uh, which will be a big part of your first year, second year, and basically all of your IC network and make contact with your companies that you um, have to research and um, try to get as much information on what you have to do, what they want you to do, and how you can do that the best possible way. Um, furthermore, um, that was kind of the presentation I prepared, but uh, I don't know if you want to say something else about year one. Being an entrepreneur is, uh, of course, not for everybody, but you know, you need to know what it's like to be an entrepreneur, and that's why we do this block. And actually, the first three blocks all give you a taste of different surroundings for a, um, a communication professional. And then the last block, they do these interviews with communication professionals to find out what their daily life is like. And everybody chooses uh, professionals in a certain context and then make a comparison. And that's um, to help students also make a final choice, a definite choice. Yes, I want to be in this program. So at the end of the year, they will know what the whole profession is about, or most of it will know what, what, what the profession is about. Okay, are there any questions for Rixt? You may wonder, uh, how is it that they speak English so, so perfectly? Well, this is because they breathe English all day. Uh, some, of, of course, are better than others. But uh, they learn to speak English and to think in English uh, after a while. And they will become better. All of them will become better. The, the girl in the, in the alumni uh, video with the perfect British accent. She's just a Dutch girl as well, and she just developed this perfect British accent. And now we have Sarah, who is um, a fourth year student, and who has had the life changer already. Thank you. Let me see. Yeah. So the third year abroad, probably the best year of your study, and to me personally, the best year of my life so far. Let's not skip ahead yet. So the third year abroad, I studied, did my study abroad in Ireland at the University of Limerick. And I did my internship abroad at the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And Rose asked me beforehand, can you say something about being homesick? Were you homesick? And honestly, if you knew me a few years ago, I wouldn't leave my mom's side. I was 17. I'd never been two weeks without my mom. And all of a sudden, I started traveling everywhere. And I really did do you mean this, that you'll be more homesick afterwards, that you want to go back to the places you've just been than you were at that place? But of course, that's personal. But to me, it was such an amazing experience that I wasn't homesick at all. My parents were more homesick of me, I would say. <laughs> so the study abroad, also as Rick said, the teachers always tell you, start early with studying and everything. And it also goes for the study abroad. And I can really tell you, really start early apply for the universities you get a list of hundreds no not hundreds but tons tons of st uh, schools you can go to pick a few you like and really research why do I want to go to that country what what makes that school look better to me why do I want to go there and really make a good choice and choose for yourself don't choose a certain school because your friend also wants to go to that country or that your friend or your boyfriend wants to go to that study I would really say follow your own heart choose your own study to go to and really start early. I know people who didn't apply for accommodation, so they literally just booked a plane ticket there and they were just gonna figure it out. That's not the kind of person I am, I would be really stressed out. So I was really hammering, I was emailing a lot of people, can I, um, can I apply for housing already early? So really, I would say start early. Be organized, check, double check, triple check everything. Especially when you go abroad, make sure that you know if you need a visa or anything in order to be in that country. I went to Ireland and England, so for me there weren't really any applications for visas. I mean, England, not yet. I mean, Brexit is coming, so you have to really watch out with that. But um, really check everything, because you're going to be in a foreign country. And it, they might be nice to you because you're 
foreign, but really make sure you have all your paperwork ready when you are there. And if you have need a permit in order to work there, make sure you have it because you don't want to be at the airport and they say, yeah, you can come in. So uh, try new things. I would really say do so. I went to Ireland and I even studied Irish. And whoever says Irish is like English is completely wrong. Because this says, hello, how are you? And you pronounce it like dia gwit, kunas ata tu. It's a completely different language and it's something I really like to do. So I would really say try new things. Of course, I also took a few communication classes to keep up with my study. But I would say just uh, you are there to make, make use of the opportunities those schools have. And of course, be open-minded. To me, For me, making friends has never been easier. I got off the plane, met a girl, and her and I are best friends now. She's coming to Groningen to study here. We've been to Canada this summer together. So we really, you make the best friends because you're all in the same boat. You're all going to be there. You're all new. So really, be open to new people. But most important of all, I would say, have lots of fun and travel as much as you can. To me, study at the at the different university wasn't as difficult as the Hansa was. Of course, at different per university. But for me, I really made sure that every weekend I had something planned. I think of the four months I was in Ireland, I spent two weeks in Ireland at my campus studying. Two weekends that I had to study. And the other weekends, I was doing things like this. So, <laughs> do that. And then your internship abroad. Again, start early. Email, email, email as many organizations as you can, as many people as you can. If you want to st go do an internship at a certain company, don't be afraid. Be bold and stand out and just email them. My dream was to do an internship for a charity, so I emailed tons and tons of charities in the UK and Ireland because I really wanted to do it over there. And out of nowhere, somebody said, yes, we could use somebody. So even though they don't have an application on their website, don't be afraid to email them. I mean, what the worst you're going to get is, no, I'm sorry, we can't have you. But if you're lucky like me, they'll say, yeah, we can use you. So that's always great. For an internship, I would say also it's important to uh, understand what you need to pass your internship. A lot of the internships require an assignment that you have to do, and a lot of companies don't really realize that, and they just give you your tasks. So make sure you keep communicating with your organization that you also get what you need out of the internship. And of course, don't be shy to show off your skills and knowledge. You're a new, brand new student. You've learned the newest theory on the communication field, and that's often you're more ahead than sometimes they are. I was in my internship and sometimes we were in a meeting and I would just say, well, why don't we do it that way? And they, they would just look at me like, yeah, she's right. A 21-year-old girl can tell you that she's right. <laughs> know, know something better. So really show off your skills and don't be afraid to stand out in an organization. And of course, keep in touch because you never know for the future. I myself, I'm still in touch with Make-A-Wish. I even went back to London last weekend and absolutely down the building and raised 300 quid for it. So that was really good. And of course, then again, you're making a lot of friends. For example, if you see here, this was on King's Day this year. And because they, everybody knew in the office that it was going to be King's Day, they all dressed up in orange. And I had a lot of stroke baffles, so we all g gave those away. So really, they're really open. Be open again. And if you say, yeah, we have a special holiday in the Netherlands, they might even dress up like me, like they did in my office. So. Really, be open to a lot of new things and don't take no for an answer. Um, I started uh, my internship of uh, the study abroad. You get a list from school and with all the universities that you can apply for. And then school gives you a deadline. You have to turn in your list with like the top five of universities. And after that, you can start contacting the university. So then I would, as soon as you know which university you're going to, I would say start um, applying or start talking to them. With the internship, I started sending out emails in October, November, and I was started end of January. So I would say that worked for me. Maybe you can start a bit later, but I like to have everything organized. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, for the camera, I'll translate. If they, they're asking if you need a scholarship, if you can get a scholarship. Um, I was able to get the Erasmus scholarship, but that was because I was a European student and studying within Europe. So then you're able, but my sister, for example, did her internship in New York, 
I wasn't able to get the Erasmus scholarship. So it really depends where you're going, I would say, and what country, because the scholarships, uh, the money you're getting from the scholarships also depends on the country. Ireland and England are, for example, qualified as very expensive <coughs> countries. So your scholarship is in the highest class that you can get. But if you, for example, I'm not sure what countries don't qualify, but if you go to a different country, the scholarship might be different. Uh, so my name is Tom Wilcox. I'm uh, one of the teachers and uh, academic counsellors uh, here in IC. Um, the academic counsellor for Group 1B. I don't know if you're aware of your... I don't think any of my students are actually here, but maybe some parents are. Some parents who know, one, who know that your child is in 1B and their academic counsellor. Um, but I also teach uh, in um, the skills module, uh, within uh, in the first year, so that's in uh, uh, skills and tools. Uh, tools being things such as InDesign and uh, Illustrator and Microsoft Word and things like that. And uh, skills is uh, slightly more broader. It's things like writing skills, uh, presenting skills, uh, but also intercultural communication is something which pops up in skills as well. Um, this being, of course international communication we focus on international aspects very much as part of what we're supposed to do um, and uh, with a hugely intercultural classroom uh, a lot of very interesting issues regarding culture come up we get we make sure that all students work in intercultural teams when you're doing a project you tend to be in a group with at least one hopefully two or more people from another culture from you uh, so you immediately run into how to work with people from different cultures and of course that's something we uh, take a look at so what I'm going to do now is in roughly 30 minutes or I don't know how much time I've got left um, condense uh, what is normally three weeks worth of classes uh, to give you a bit of an idea of what we do in block one of year one when it comes to intercultural communication. So for uh, the students here, sorry, we just finished this part. You've just done your final assignment and I'm gonna tell you about it all over again. Uh, but uh, let's see. Um, whoop. Well, what did I just do? I don't want that, go away, yes. All right, um, just a very quick overview for you. Uh, this is what our first uh, block looks like for just skills. It can get a little bit complicated. We've got a lot of different things going on in here. We focus on writing skills and presentation skills and intercultural communication skills in one block uh, and also Microsoft Word and also Adobe Illustrator and altogether those things get you one grade at the end of the block which can take a little while for the students to get their heads around because it's a little complicated. Hence this overview here. Uh, and what we're focusing on today is ICC, so intercultural communication and that's we spent the first three weeks of the block talking about it, and then just last Friday, there was a deadline for the assignment for that. So that part is closed off and done, so that uh, you can all focus on other things, like this week's writing assignment, and next couple of weeks from now, the presentation assignment, and of course, the exam and the project and all the other things. Uh, so just so you know, so this, these three classes that I'm going to be talking about uh, in a very short amount of time today. Um, we're working towards intercultural competence. In other words, being competent in interculturalness, interculturality. Uh, that, and that's not a real word, but it describes, I think, what we're trying to do here. Um, and these are levels of intercultural competence uh, that our book that we like to use uh, uh, describes. Uh, level five, of course, being the highest, uh, the most advanced version. What we're focusing on is the very beginning part, namely cultural awareness. And you might be thinking, well, I am aware of culture, um, and that's true, but there's different levels of intercultural awareness that you can have. Uh, and what we try to do in this first module called My Cultural Baggage is try and highlight what that cultural baggage is. What is this culture that you carry around with you all the time, invisibly, that you can't shed because it's just something you've been given. Um, we focus on learning outcomes in uh, uh, University of Applied Science Education, in HBO Education, uh, and these are the learning outcomes for this particular knowledge, uh, 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 sorry, this particular module. Um, the student is able to analyze their own cultural identity, recognizes their perspective on the world being uh, inevitably, to some extent, uh, uh, influenced by culture, uh, acknowledging differences in cultural perspectives, and developing cultural curiosity. And how do you test whether someone's developed cultural curiosity? Uh, 
good question, a little bit difficult. Uh, but we do have an assessment for this, and it comes in a written form where basically you take um, a, an experience you've had, an intercultural experience you've had, and if you've had none, by the end of this block, or at this point in this block, you already have had some anyway, just by being in an intercultural classroom. Um, something that happened to you, positive, negative, whatever it might be, that you just discovered you were aware of, an intercultural difference there. And to take that which you would normally go, oh, that was interesting, this happened, that person wanted to do this, I wanted to do that, because we're from different places. And actually expanding that into looking at it from a more theoretical perspective. How does that actually work? Why did that difference happen? Or why do we think it might be that that difference happened? Because it's virtually impossible to actually definitively say why. So this is what's just happened. The students have just finished this assignment uh, last week and they have no idea yet whether they did it right because they've got, not got their feedback yet. Um, okay, so first thing we ask is what actually is culture? It's a word that you know, use all the time, but what does it actually mean? How could you define it if you can define it at all? Anyone have some ideas for me on how we could define this word? What are we talking about? Are we talking about paintings in a museum or traditional dress or what are we talking about? Values? Yeah? Something else? Something more? Because yes, definitely. But there's more to it, of course. Behavior. Behaviors. Yes, all right. Wait a minute, let me see. Behavior, hey. Values, oh, fantastic. Oh, good, good answers, fantastic. Um, yes, uh, and the key being that it's something that is shared by a group of people. All right, so uh, the culture, as we are defining it within the scope of this particular course, at least, because there are many ways in which you can define it, um, is... Uh, something that uh, you, uh, a, a sort of a filter through which you experience the world and do things which has been given to you by a social group that you are in. And that it, it indeed influences things like your values uh, and your behavior uh, and other things like that. Um, so what we're going to be doing is trying to um, um, dig a little deeper as in how does that actually work, at least according to some theories. Uh, Hofstede being one of the theorists that we, uh, that we use a lot, um, and uh, what he says, culture's like your nose, everybody can see it except yourself, which is true, except that you can kind of see your nose as well, so, but maybe that's the point. Uh, you can sort of see your own culture if you try really hard, and that's what we're going to do. He also sees it as collective programming of the mind. Uh, it's the software that you use to run your mind with. Okay, these are all very interesting little... Uh, uh, metaphors for it. Um, okay, it's something that you have learned what to do. Okay, this is a video of uh, of my one year old. Which uh, okay, here we go. And then he got mad and he threw it away. Um, so what we're looking at here, what, what, what is happening here? He's, he's eaten the lemon, but what, what kind of behavior is this? He created his first trauma. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, yeah, yes. Uh, well, first, I don't know, but yes. Um, he, uh, uh, is, this, is this something that he has learned to do, culturally speaking? Or is he, he's basically displaying a natural reaction to this, right? If you taste something sour, if you give that to a baby, that's going to happen. Oh, welcome back. No problem. Um, yeah, and so th this was here to illustrate the difference between the learned behavior and a natural behavior, and we're going to look at that in a minute. But I also, I kind of like the, I, the, the example, partly because it's, it's cute and it makes all the students go, ah, oh, and I go, well, that's my kid, and then they, they like me a little bit more. But um, I, I hope. But... Um, but also because I think it's actually interesting because it's, not, it's never quite as simple as that. And without jumping into psychology and development and how uh, human beings work in that regard, because it's a little bit beyond the scope of what we're doing, um, it's not quite as simple as he has just done this. Because he actually, if you can't see it here, but behind his hand here is an already devoured piece of lemon. He already ate a whole piece of lemon before this video happened. So he knew what it tasted like. So... I think he was also reacting to the fact that there's a whole table of grown-ups going, oh, look what he's doing, and the fact that he picked it up and did it again. And oh, Maybe his reaction's a little over the top. Maybe he's being a bit theatrical. I'm not sure. So there is some learned, learned aspects to that as well. Uh, or maybe it's part of his personality. I'm not sure. And that's what 
this is about. So this is, again, according to Hofstadter, um, just to put culture in perspective here, yes, it determines your behavior and your values and uh, has a huge influence, but of course it's not everything. Right? We acknowledge that part as well. There are some things which are just human nature, like if you lick something sour like a lemon, it makes your face do something funny. Um, and of course, there's also the individual as well. Right? So we, we just put it in perspective here. And we see it in, uh, it's in this pyramid form to kind of show that it's um, layers in a way. We're all human beings, but then some of us come from a certain culture. And within that culture, each of us has their own personality and interprets it its own, his or her own way. Okay, just getting all of this part out of the way before we jump into looking at how culture then, or well, different cultures can work in different ways. One final thing that we need to focus on is subcultures. So what do we actually mean when it comes to defining culture? Our knee-jerk reaction is to go co uh, countries, right? National cultures. Uh, English people are like this and Dutch people are like that, right? And you will have experienced a lot of that, as have I being from Britain but growing up in Holland. I had my fair share of... Um, British-Dutch cultural differences, but also similarities. But of course, it's much more complicated than that. We just define culture as being a group of people uh, or something that a group of people shares and how that group gives you uh, um, your norms and values and behaviors. And of course, there's more groups than simply your country, um, whether it's within the country or even bigger than that, right? So you could have, for example, European versus Asian culture, say, if you're looking at a continent level. Uh, of course, you've got the country itself, but within the country, there's a whole bunch of other subcultures that we all belong to. Unless we hang out all by ourselves all day long, we probably belong to some subcultures, whether it's you know, your friend group or even your, your family home is a tiny little mini culture. You have your own norms and values and traditions and things that you have been raised with within your family home. Uh, and so I'm kind of describing what we do rather than actually doing it because of the three weeks becoming 30 minutes. Um, but uh, what I would do here is uh, have the students write down as many subcultures that they belong to that they can think of. So just to kind of become aware of what that is and how each of those does indeed influence you. And so as an individual, aside from the personality aspect that we saw here, you also have your own unique mix of cultures. Uh, you can be Dutch and someone who plays football on the weekends, and uh, Christian, and uh, from your particular family, from your particular school, from your town, small town, big town, all of these different things have a cultural influence on you and make this unique uh, makeup. And so part of the assignment, the final assignment, is also uh, to, as much as possible, map out uh, in the context of the uh, situation that you are describing in the assignment, which subcultures were at play here. I did a thing a certain way, not just because I'm Dutch, but also because that's how my family did it, and because that's how people in my village did it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so that's quite a fun thing. And then, once we've established this aspect of um, uh, uh, of, of what we're talking about here with cultures, so something in between personality and human nature, the group aspect, subcultures as well as countries, then we look at these two models, which are basically the same thing. The iceberg model and the onion model. Two ways of saying there are three layers here. And this is not related to the human nature, personality, culture. But this is within your culture itself, how the culture works. And these two models try and illustrate and understand the same basic idea, which is there are the things that you can actually see. So the outside of the onion or the top of the iceberg above the surface of the water. And these are what we normally like to think of as cultural differences, right? Uh, eating with knife and fork or chopsticks, say, for example. That's a very uh, uh, clear example. You see it and you go, huh, it's different. But that thing that's above the, iceberg, uh, the, to above the water line or on the outside of the, of the circle, outside of the onion, that's all you can see. But there's a lot going on under the surface that led to that. The, simple, the, the, the easier part to dig into is the norms and behaviors, and something was already mentioned, right? Values, norms and values. Uh, it's often easy to say the reason why we do things this way is because we believe blah, 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 blah. Whether it's, uh, I mean, the chopstick and knife and fork one is a little hard in that regard. Why would you choose one or the other? Just because that's what you know. Um, but let's say um, you, um, in your football club, to talk of a subculture, have... 
uh, tradition that after the game on the weekend, you also all hang around afterwards to have a drink together. And it's kind of seen as, it's frowned upon if you don't do that. Because it's part of team building. And the social aspect is important, because then you're a close-knit group, things like that. Or what's currently, of course, very much in the news all the time, uh, student associations like, uh, like Vindicat or Albertus, right? And the initiation uh, at the start, the hazing at the beginning of, the, of, of your membership, which is seen as controversial. Uh, the reason given for that is this is part of you know, making people feel part of the group and creating a bond. Uh, so there's a value that's already explained that goes behind it. We just see people do it that way, but they can quite easily say, well, we do it that way because. So that's the, the second level. The way we do things around here, what's right and wrong, what's normal. But what's really interesting to get into is something which is much harder to see in yourself, let alone in others, which is what lies below those norms and values in the first place. Why do you have those norms and values? Because there are some, what are called basic assumptions, according to some theorists, beliefs and assumptions. Uh, here they are, basic assumptions that are unconscious and taken for granted ways of seeing the world. And that's where it becomes tougher to do, but also really interesting to play around with. Okay, so what we then do in the second two classes, this is all class number one, the second two classes is dig into some theorists' categorizations of these basic assumptions. So there are several different theorists that we're going to look at. I'm only going to jump into a couple now uh, that say, okay, we've highlighted or we've, we've, we've organized what we see into six basic categories of basic assumptions. And then there's another theorist that's done the same, or six or eight, I think. Uh, another theorist that's done the same, and another one's done the same, and they're all different, but they kind of describe similar things, and they overlap a little bit. Because ultimately, and this is something we try to uh, repeat as much as possible, this is looking at something very, very abstract, right? This idea of culture and how this works. So that's not tangible at all. And trying through models like this, which of course aren't real, to somehow simplify it and organize it and make sense of it, right? So this is not the way the world officially works or anything like that, but it's uh, trying to kind of make an overview of what it is that we see. Um, and so these theorists are doing the same things. And one of the things we constantly say is, this does not mean that this culture is like that because everyone in it does it this way because they believe this. Rather, if you experience an intercultural situation, you could try and understand it by seeing things from their perspective, by trying to see that maybe they think this way because, rather than you are German, therefore you are always on time because you believe in that. Right? Because I can tell you, a very good German friend of mine is the latest person I know. He's never on time at all. Obviously, there's always exceptions to the rule. Right? We know this. Stereotypes are not uh, uh, truth, necessarily. So, we get into... Um, Oh yeah, this is the, uh, the subculture example. Yes, yes, yes. So this would be something we do. We don't have time for that at all. How much time do I have? I have no idea. Oh, really? Well, I won't do that to you. That's, uh, that's a little bit too, too much in a row. Don't worry. Yeah. These are the three theorists uh, that we look at. Well, four, if you count Hall and Hall as being two people, which they were. Um, and each one of them has... Uh, uh, as I said, yes, six different uh, basic assumptions. I'm going to pick two from each and um, go through that with you. And how we like to do that is to get a discussion going. Right? This is me talking all the time. But we like to get a discussion going um, of, uh, in the classroom of, oh, yeah, well, I once experienced this and that, and I think that maybe it was because of, right? to try and get uh, 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 an understanding of it. Hall and Hall. I'm going to look at the first two on this list, high and low context communication and monochronic and polychronic time. To start with, for the high and low context communication, this is something you don't have anything to write with right now, and I'm not going to make you write stuff down. Um, but uh, some of you will remember this from a few weeks ago. Um, I gave this assignment. Take a moment to describe your family home. Um, family house, family home, I don't know. It was deliberately vague. Right? You do what you want with this particular assignment. Describe it. Write down some characteristics, uh, specifically for someone who's never been there before. So I was thinking maybe right now I could say describe it to the person next to you, but you probably come from the same family home, so that doesn't really work. Um, but if you think for a second in your head, how would you describe your family home? Uh, how would you do it? Where would you start? Can someone give me an example? Uh, you don't need to go into 
too much detail if you don't, don't want to describe your family home in front of everyone, but uh, how would you start telling, giving me an idea of the family home? Anybody? Yes. The location of the house. The location of the house. Okay, as in... What town, yeah, what kind of street? Okay, yeah. And, and then? I don't know, maybe how big it is or... How big? All right, yeah. Rooms how many rooms? Yeah, the layout perhaps of yeah. the rooms. Yeah, okay, nice. But, yeah. but also be the atmosphere. The atmosphere. Okay, nice. All right, this is interesting. So that was the second, yeah. that was your second thought, that maybe I could describe the atmosphere as well. <laughs> okay, interesting, yeah. Uh, would anyone, was anyone thinking I would start with describing more atmospheric aspects? Yeah, it's, really, it's really, you did that in class, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's really cozy, um, uh, or I live there with my family, right? Not the house itself, but who else is in there, for example. Um, and the point of this exercise, uh, and, and now I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it right because I'm kind of pushing you in certain directions, but it's really just don't tell anyone, just write it down, and then we compare what people wrote down. And you see that people take very different approaches. Um, and it's interesting because it relates to this con notion of high and low context communication, um, where low context implies that you don't need much context to describe detail. In this particular example, you describe, for example, it has X number of rooms, it's laid out like this. Uh, you come in through the front door and on your left is the living room. Uh, in the living room there is a table and a chair and, and etc. Um, or, as this picture is supposed to symbol symbolize, uh, you describe the feeling of the place. Or perhaps not even the house itself. I've had quite a few examples where I didn't even know if it was an apartment or a house or what. I have no idea, but I do know which part of town it's in. And, and things like that. So the context surrounding it is more important. The reason why this is a thing is because it shows how you understood my request and what you thought would be the best way to help me understand your home. What do I need to understand your home? Do I need to know specifics or do I need to know context? And those can be very fundamentally different ways of, of approaching things and it can lead to say, cultural clashes, if you're working together with someone, because um, ways that it can work in practice might be um, if you are very, very, from a very, very low context culture, or you, you think in a very low context way, you, just, you require someone to say exactly what they mean right to your face all the time. And others might never do that, because they might perceive that as being, say, rude or direct or blunt, uh, and, but do expect you to understand what they mean by describing aspects around it, right? And then helping you get to the conclusion yourself. Uh, and you might find that very frustrating because you want them to just tell them, tell you what, the, what you mean. And this can lead to big issues. And that can lead to then clashes, which is they're not being honest, they are being rude, right? And that's above the water iceberg tip stuff. Uh, or maybe even just below. Their values are wrong. They value politeness. Uh, you value honesty. But the underneath part is this, and this is where, if you understand that difference, then you can also understand why the other stuff is different too. Uh, and that's basically the, the focus of all of these. Monochronic and polychronic time is something that we uh, encounter very quickly in practice. Um, it's to do with how you perceive time as a, as a uh, I guess, a, a part of your life, <laughs> a phenomenon or something. Um, Example being, well, can someone think of an example before I explain what exactly we mean? What, is it, what would you consider to be different ways of looking at time? Possibly. Or is time to you such a fixed thing? There are no different ways of looking at it. Time is time. Right? And this is why this can be kind of difficult to do. Yes? Um, time in a way of time is money. Time is money. So there is not enough of it and you have to use every minute that is there. Yeah. And then um, there's more than enough time. There's more than enough time. Okay. So enjoy the time itself in a sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. That's a, that would definitely be uh, two uh, expressions of this difference for sure. Yeah. Um, monochronic and polychronic. Um, it relates to how, whether you see time as being something that is uh, um, fixed and that is um, 
is leading. It, the, the time leads how things go, and it's more the time is money perspective. This is how much time you have. You need to get things done. Organize your time. Be somewhere on time, and this is the most obvious uh, thing. Be on time. Class starts at this time. Show up on time. Our group, our project group, is meeting at half past, so we're all there at half past. Maybe 25 to, because you know, sometimes buses are like that, but that's still acceptable. But hey, if you're there at on the hour, and we're supposed to meet at half past, that's rude, right? That's inconsiderate. And a lot of us feel that very, very de deeply, right? It's considerate to be there at the time you agreed to be there. That's a very monochronic perspective. Uh, and the polychronic time, I find it really hard to explain because that's how ingrained it is, and, and I am more from a monochronic culture, like most of you here, uh, is you see time as more something that kind of happens to you, that you encounter along the way. That's uh, uh, one way that I like to try and understand it, at least. Um, yes? It's when people are more important than the time. Yeah, for example. Yes, exactly. And you might say that in the, in the context of the group, showing up on time means that you value the people because you're being considerate of those people. But that's not how it would be seen by the polychronic person. They would say, well, I ran into someone I knew on the way here and I'm not going to be rude to them and say, I have to go to work now. I'm going to stop and talk to them. How could I not stop and talk to them? Because that happened to you in the day. Right? And so we see this on a much larger scale level in those countries where that's much more of the norm. And if you go there as a monochronic person, it's very confusing to, uh, to, to, to adjust to that. Uh, but the reason for these two pictures is because we talked before about subcultures. We all have a little bit of interculturality within us already. So in different subcultures, you have different time norms. If you're meeting at work or school, meeting is at 2.30. If you are invited to a friend's party and they say it starts at 9, this example works better for the students than the parents, I think. <laughs> the party starts at 9, do you show up at 9? No, right? That would be weird. You show up somewhere between 9 and midnight, uh, depending on you know, who it is and who you're going with and whatever. So suddenly you are extremely polychronic, right? And nobody minds if you're a little later. A little, we'll see what happens. You're having fun. Why would you schedule having fun? Right? It gets in the way, and that's a very polychronic perspective, which you're all very used to having. It just depends on what subculture you're in and what context you're in. Yes. So this one, uh, yeah, when, when, when we have project disputes, uh, sometimes we gently say, remember the monochronic and polychronic time? Perhaps you could understand your fellow student that way. Oh, yes. Um, so, yeah. All right, so Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, the reason why it's kind of fun to do a joke there is not just because jokes are fun, but because jokes often rely on implicit understanding, right, of, of what's going on here. We all go, ah, I get it, because of the, uh -huh. So we share that we understand what's funny about this thing. Um, and in doing so, it can actually be an interesting way to illustrate what, is, what we're all expected to know. And, and this shared understanding is a cultural thing, of course. Um, and so what's funny here is he has turned around his expectations of time, the importance of time. Uh, we all assume that at school you're supposed to be on time because of the monochronic perspective, whereas he is different. At school, he doesn't care, but when it comes to Saturday and free time, he got to get up really, really early to uh, be on time for that. The point is, well, yeah. Um, I think you got the point. Um, okay. All right. Moving swiftly onwards. Number two out of three. Kluckhorn, which I have trouble pronouncing, but the Germans in the class always try and help me, but I can never do it. Um, I'm going to pick two out of these. Might yes. Dominating or subjugated to nature and individual individualism and collectivism. Um, this one's a little interesting because uh, Claude Cohn's um, approach was uh, from a slightly more anthropo anthropological, anthropological approach. Um, and it was more to do with very sort of basic you know, cultures being groups of people surviving in the world. Uh, and that a lot of these very basic assumptions have grown out from that, right? From the from very kind of primitive, we, what do we do to survive perspectives? And that some, you know, we've grown in different directions when it comes to that. When you're applying it in real life now, of course, that can feel a little bit weird and remote, but it still uh, 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 does work. Um, dominating or subjugation to nature. Here we have uh, Texas and, of course, um, here. Two things, two phenomena, natural phenomena, sometimes places flood if you live in areas where it can flood. So what do you do to not die when that happens? 
as much as possible at least. Um, you can either make it not flood anymore, like uh, here in the Netherlands, or you can make it that when it does flood, your house is still okay. All right, so all you could also talk about the older uh, uh, Dutch cultures of building the churches and the villages on little hills, right? And it's the same idea, of course. Um, this would be, I would say, is this subjugation to or harmony? Maybe somewhere in between. Living in harmony with, because, well, nature does its thing and we're okay, but, you know, nature made us do this. So it's, I guess, subjugating as well. Uh, another way of looking at water uh, this is the Hoover Dam in the U.S., and this is uh, somewhere else. <laughs> Maybe It looks British to me, but uh, maybe that's just an assumption on my part. Um, the same thing, right? How do we harness the power of the water? Well, we just put a little wheel in the water and get some power out of it, or stop the water altogether and force it through our dam so that we can control everything, right? Similar idea. And the, the, the point of the two examples is, to, is to, to show, and this is, again, something we try to focus as well, it's very easy to start comparing one as being better than the other when it comes to any of these assumptions. Because you have one of them, so you f find yours superior because you, it's so deeply ingrained. Of course it's better. That's how you see the world. Um, and to try and kind of cross-reference them a bit and say, like, well, yes, it would seem that perhaps this is the way to go because we're from here and it means we don't have to build our houses on sticks. You know, it's kind of nice not having to put our houses on, on stills. So, but you could also look at the same... A comparison here, I would say this is probably nicer than uh, stopping a river from running in a desert, right? So sometimes the dominating of nature is not the best, of course. But these are very concrete examples. How do we see that as being something more abstract and culturally defining? Like, how would it affect us in our day to day? If, say, again, like this is University of Applied Sciences, we apply this in the communication profession, international communication profession, at what point you, would you have to think in your mind, ah, maybe this person is from a subjugation to nature culture? Can someone think of an example or something that's actually happened to you where this might be a, a contrast? Because it's very easy to just go, look, we built a dike, so we are nature dominating, but how does that really affect us? I don't have one, by the way, so I really hope you do, because I don't have an example right now. The only thing that I see is, mm. if you look at the houses on, st on stilts, yeah. in the US it's more normal that people take care of themselves, it's, it's more, and in the Netherlands it's much more state that we look at the government and the government takes care of us. Right. That's the only difference, so that's why... This I is a small-scale solution. Yes. Yeah. That, that is typical America. Right, and you so might translate start, that. I buy more guns so I can protect myself instead right. of delivering the gun. Fair enough, yeah. yeah. Exactly. No, yeah, no, for sure. And so if you were, say, uh, uh, meeting an American colleague, say, or uh, entering an American market with a company or something like that, you would take that on that kind of general level into account. And that it's, it's expressed in this particular example in this way. Uh, but indeed that, well, actually, oh, what a nice segue. Thank you very much. Ah, look, individualistic versus collectivistic culture. Uh, individualism is exactly what you just described, right? And in many ways, these different assumptions overlap. And you can pick and choose, like, this one applies a little bit better to this situation. And in fact, I hope that you found in your assignment that you picked certain ones that related to the example you had and didn't try and force all of them onto that example, because that doesn't necessarily work. Uh, individualism, collectivism, um, uh, this is, uh, you can see by his little NS logo on his jacket here. This is where we live. Um, anyone who's taken a train, or even worse, a bus when the train's not working, uh, knows that this is what it's like getting onto that vehicle, right? Survival of the fittest, right? Um, and that on the right is a train station in Japan, where you have on the ground perfect lines that you have to stand in because the train's going to stop there and first come, first on the train. Um, Examples of individualistic versus collectivistic culture. This other one um, is, uh, again, me trying to show different sides to the same coin in a way. Uh, because, again, we might go, well, sure, that is well organized. Well, I, British person, go, well, that's, that's preferable to me. That's nicely organized, right? It's more fair, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but, of course, the flip side to that is um, not to be negative to football culture or anything like that. But, you know... Collectivism can also mean lack of individuality, individual expression. Everyone's wearing the same, everyone's following each other. Um, and you can see that in, 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 in larger cultures as well. And this was 
the result I got when I googled eccentric person. The idea being, uh, this person is, does his own thing, his own way. Anyway, um, yeah, I don't know, right? I, I've, I've, I've actually googled this because I'm British, <laughs> and uh, there is whole discussions online about, you know, um, the Dutch way of not queuing and why that's better. Anyone care to uh, advocate this approach? Go for it. I mean, you might think, no, this is more effective, ultimately. <laughs> okay, no, no, there, no yeah, I know, it sounds, yeah, but there were really, no, there were very true, uh, very uh, uh, genuine and well thought out explanations as to why it is better and examples of where it perhaps does work better, right? That, uh, I don't know, maybe studies that show that if everyone just kind of makes their way, that ultimately a group organizes itself more efficiently than if you force people to wait in line, say, and that kind of stuff. The Albert Hein is always a difficult one when you've got the individual little uh, cash checkouts. Do you all wait in one line and then go to the next one that's free? Or do you all wait there in that line and someone goes, hey, there's one of free over there and just walks past and goes to it? Uh, it's, a, it's a daily struggle. Yeah. Anyway, the point being it's not superior or inferior. But of course, this is just an example of queuing and, and, and following the crowd. But this, to use the example of, say, the family subculture, right? You might be in a genu gen generally uh, uh, individualistic society, say, like Western Europe, the US, but you might also find that within your particular family, um, the family well-being goes above your individual well-being, say. Um, for example, you study something which will get you a job which will be stable because that's more important than, you know, following what you happen to be interested in at that particular moment. Many uh, families uh, see things that way. Uh, and then you get, you know, lawyers and doctors and stuff, and it's great. Um, but uh, so that would be a more collectivistic, even within an individualistic society. Right? And so and the, the, the classic intercultural example, although I'm always very hesitant to use these kinds of examples because I know that I'm being generalistic then, uh, is things like, say, the, the uh, tiger mom of uh, East Asia, right? That just kid must learn all everything really, really well. And they all become amazing at what they do, but they were forced to do that with no chance to do, you know, uh, focus on their own thing. They have to do what's right for the family and become really successful, say. That's a very collectivistic approach to things. Alrighty. Finally, Hofstede, who also, note, has the same thing, individualism, collect collectivism, so that overlaps there. I'm gonna look at two more here and then we'll be done, I promise. Um, high and low power distance and uncertainty avoidance. High and low power distance is something we encounter all the time when students put this into practice in not always the best way. Here's an example of how it gets put into practice in the way we don't necessarily want, which is um, I'm going to give communication advice. You are entering a market in uh, China. In China, there is a high power distance. So you must do things this way in order to succeed. Right? Sure, but it's a little bit more nuanced than that. And again, it's the problem that we look into that this, is, this, this should not be seen as an instruction manual for the world, but more the idea is to foster better understanding and better consideration of all particular perspectives there. Anyway, high and low power distance um, is, well, I guess as the name suggests, how far is the distance between different people uh, in different levels of power. So uh, the classroom is a subculture and we like to use that example a lot because we're all there in the classroom. Uh, here at Hansa, we don't have a very high and low power, uh, we have a very low power distance. Uh, I'm standing up here talking to you and you're being quiet, so there is some, but that's about it, right? You can interrupt me and go to the bathroom, no problem, right? For example, that's no, not a problem at all. And you felt this and it was fine, right? Because we already understood that that was what the power distance was. Some coming from abroad find that really jarring even from just across the border in Germany, they often find that to be weird because they're used to their teachers in Germany being way higher up the power ladder and that uh, you, know, you only address them in a certain way and, and things like that. Uh, we hadn't used the religion subculture yet, so within one general religion as a whole, Christianity, right? you've got your uh, traditional Catholicism and uh, more free, uh, uh, whatever that might be, a, a form of Protestantism, but uh, not sure which one. Uh, but you see, right, everyone's praying together there, and in that one, of course, you have all the symbolism of the hierarchy uh, in dress and everything like that. Again, this works for a huge number of people, and this works for a huge number of people, because they 
see this from a different way. Um, but this makes a big, big difference, and it can lead to everyday struggles in class for me and, and uh, my fellow teaching colleagues as well. The person sitting in the back quietly who you think is probably fine because they didn't speak up might be missing everything because they don't dare to speak up because that is so ingrained. This high power distance is so ingrained that they would never interrupt the teacher. Or that, in fact, even asking a question implies the teacher didn't do their job right, so I'm not going to do it, even though I have no idea what they're talking about. Right? They, and then you only find that way later down the line, and you wish they would have approached you, but that's because it's my problem, because I only see things in low power distance form. Even after talking about this, I can't change it necessarily, but hopefully it makes me be more understanding to that student when they, after class, come quietly to me and ask all the questions that they should have asked earlier. Right? And then the last one, because again, it's very uh, applicable to right now, uh, uncertainty avoidance. Um, do you have, uh, do you find it f scary when you are given free reign? Is this a problem? And this, the ICC, the Intercultural Communication Assignment of the other day, is very like this. It literally is just describe a thing that happened to you and apply some of these theories. And I get all these questions like, how many words? And um, but which ones? And, and which ones were we supposed to apply? And, but I don't understand. Which thing do we do first, etc.? Which is very this side of things. Avoiding uncertainty, needing to know exactly what's coming. And this is University of Applied Sciences. This is HBO. It's supposed to be applied. You're supposed to be given the knowledge that you need in order to take it in real life and go, all right, I'm supposed to do it like this and this and this and this. And so this is a thing that we run into whenever we do something that's a little bit more abstract, a little bit more floaty like this or a bit more free creative, it can be scary to people. We do presentation skills at the moment, and the first thing we do is, all right, doesn't matter what you talk about, get up here and speak for one minute. And that is so scary to people. Not the speaking part, but the not knowing what you're going to speak about and having to make it up, even though you get a little bit of time. But, but what, do we, what kind of thing do we have to talk about? I don't know. What do you want to tell us about? Just tell us something. That's nice, isn't it? No, it's not nice at all. If you don't like uncertainty, if you, if you don't like uncertainty, if you're avoidant of uncertainty, this is a problem. And it can lead to real, again, classroom clashes because of coming from a different place. And this is me trying to force this onto this, which can be a difficult thing to do. Anyway, um, I think you get the idea. <laughs> and so we did that, but then with all of them and with a lot more of you talking and a lot less of me talking, uh, but for time reasons, I had to uh, force it through. But I hope this gives you a bit of an idea of one of the many things that we're doing, um, one of the many ways that we're looking at this. And this is, as I said earlier on, just step one. After that is, okay, can you work with this? Can you uh, advise people on how to use this? And that's further levels of intercultural understanding. Um, okay, thank you very much for listening to me, and uh, see you later on. Thank you, Tom. I was immediately reminded of Sarah, who said, start early, email, email, email. Maybe a little bit of uncertainty avoidance there with you. <laughs> yeah, I had things organized. Yes, yeah, yeah, you had things organized. Okay, um, this is the end of our session here. Uh, we invite you all to come down with us and have a drink and talk a little bit afterwards. You can talk to our teachers if your son or daughter is in one of their groups. You can talk to them together. Um, and uh, Bob's, for instance, and Peter will probably also be downstairs. I hope you liked it here. And um, uh, as our dean said, our next meeting with you will be at the diploma ceremony um, in 2020. 2021, was it? Or 2020? No, 21. 21, okay. She has already got it in her diary, probably. Yeah. So um, it's usually the second week of July on a Thursday and we'll be there and hopefully you'll be there as well. Um, thank you very much for showing up today and uh, have a nice drink afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.